Hi, my name is DM Barr, and I am an author groupie. I'm also the author of such psychological thrillers as Expired Listings, Slashing Mona Lisa, and the upcoming Saving Grace, if you're looking to discover a new author in your next great read. Today's guest on Author Groupie is Pamela Taylor. Pamela writes historical fantasy in her third book of her second Sun series comes out this month, with the fourth installment due out in December. She talks about what goes into planning a series, how to research historical fiction and fun fact it can involve travel, and also how, to, how just walking your dogs can be a great way to develop a scene. So sit back, enjoy, and as always, stay safe. Welcome to another edition of Author Groupie. I'm here with Pamela Taylor. Uh, on June 11th, Pamela Taylor will be releasing Pestilence, the third in a four-part historical fantasy Second Sun series published by Black Rose Writing. Her love of history goes back to her youth. She was a history major in college, but her interests are far reaching from travel and photography to flying private planes. And she is a multilingual, classically trained musician. When she isn't writing, Pamela works in the software industry. Is that pretty accurate, Pamela? I get that right? Uh, I think it's, it's actually past tense on the work right now. Uh, I'm uh, full-time editing and freelance, freelance editing and writing now. Oh, perfect. Well, welcome to Author Groupie. And um, I've got a bunch of questions for you because you had a really interesting bio. Um, so in your online bio, you draw parallels between writing fiction, playing classical music, and coding software. Can you talk a little bit about that? Could you repeat the question? The, the, sure. In the your bio, broke up. Sorry, in your bio online, you drew some parallels between writing fiction, playing classical music, and coding software. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Of course. Um, there's particularly the music and the writing um, connection. There's a rhythm to writing. There's a flow to writing. And there's phrasing to writing. And the same sort of thing exists in music. And I don't know whether this is a common phenomenon that an ear for one in one genre um, flows over into another genre, as for me it does between music and uh, writing. But I do feel like the fact that I was trained young actually get the the notion of phrasing and rhythm and ideas like this uh, has probably helped me in many ways in my in my writing um, as far as the software industry is concerned gosh I wrote more things when I was working in in computer software than I can even imagine technical white papers promotional materials for software products uh, user documentation, uh, presentations on strategy, uh, and you know, in some sense, all of that is storytelling. But it's very different when you're in the world of fiction, and as an author, you have this great responsibility to to introduce your characters, to build their world, to make your readers identify with them and want to follow along with them. So, so there's some big differences between technology writing and fiction. Absolutely. So I've always been fascinated by historical fiction and I know you've written a number of how-to articles on the craft and those links are on your website if any of our readers or listeners want to read them. Um, and I think what's always scared me off is the research. How can you be sure that you're getting everything in the time period correct, especially in your case when you're writing the writing um, about things that took place over 600 years ago? What's your process? I think the best way to describe the, the general getting the fundamentals right before you get started is immersion and osmosis. I just read a ton of stuff and just let it all soak in. Some of it is primary sources, some of it is nonfiction and really getting the, the details and what the world at that time was like into my head. But I don't hesitate to use secondary sources as well. I read a ton of 
historical fiction myself, as you might imagine. Sure. And a lot of that also just works its way into the brain and it's there to tap into. Now, when you're using secondary sources, of course, you have to verify and validate those. Um, travel is another thing that actually contributes to the research because one of the things I thoroughly enjoy and have found is extremely helpful is going to places that are of the time period. They may be ruins now or they may still be preserved, but either way, when you stand in that place and you're actually absorbing the atmosphere, you can let your imagination run free and you can imagine what kind of people would have been there and what roles they would have had and how they would dress and what they might be doing, even down to details like what they might be eating. Um, when you put yourself in the place, it all becomes very, very real. And in that sense, it becomes very easy to tap into when you start writing. It all kind of comes back to the surface. You know, this brain is this wonderful thing that brings back things when we need it. And, um, and so that sort of immersion in osmosis is my fundamental basic research tool. But Perfect. Perfect. There's also a thing that I like to call just in time research. And the internet is wonderful for that. You might be riding along and suddenly you need some little detail like, oh my gosh, who was the Pope in the year 1314? Well, you know, a quick internet search, you got it. You almost don't have to break your train of thought from the scene you're working on. So I actually use just-in-time research as well as. Since we were speaking about research, I'm just curious if the genre of historical fantasy gives you a little bit more flexibility when it comes to being precise about the past. Possible that's the case. I try not to let it be the case. The only reason that mine my series gets that historical fantasy uh, label is because the setting is not 100% real. But that was a conscious decision on my part because I wanted to tell the story of characters that did not involve actual characters that lived at the time of the early Renaissance. And the history of Northern Europe, the, um, the settings, the locations, the people who lived at the time, the actors, the events are all so very well known that I am decided that it would just be asking too much of my readers to suspend disbelief and accept the fact that there was a different set of royalty or a different set of nobility at the time. So I created a setting and I created a world that bears a lot of resemblance to Northern Europe, but isn't precisely any one place. Now that said, I have tried very hard to keep the, the historical details in terms of um, how the people lived and what the science was at the time and what the the um, even down to things like uh, when did paper become available and when was it available widely enough that people would use it for sending messages rather than resorting to um, parchment or vellum or the old style things. And I've tried to keep all of those details as precise and accurate as I possibly can. So um, I understand that Pestilence is volume three of the second Sun Chronicle series. Can you give us an overview of the series since you were alluding to it? And did you plan the whole series in advance or did it evolve as you wrote each book? And would each stand alone or do people have to start reading at book one? I know that's a lot. <laughs> that's okay. It's really, it's really a good way to give an overview of the, of the series. Um, <clears throat> Right now, six books are planned, but I'll come back to that later. Um, the main character, the protagonist, Alfred, 
is the second son of the second son of the king. And as such, he might figure in the succession, but it's unlikely. So he expects his life to be rather unremarkable. Uh, his grandfather, however, has a different idea. He's convinced that Alfred has some sort of special destiny, but he doesn't have the foresight to see exactly what that might be. So the narrative arc of the Chronicles as a whole is Alfred's discovery of what that destiny eventually comes to be. Um, each of the books has a complete story arc uh, unto itself. And so you could read each in book individually. And I try in subsequent volumes after the first one to put sufficient backstory and introduction of the characters that if somebody's picking up with volume two or three or four, they're not entirely lost. That said, I think people will enjoy going on Alfred's journey with him if they begin with him at the beginning. Sure. Um, originally, the series started from the first paragraph of the first volume that was one of those things that sort of came to me in the middle of the night. One of those two in the morning, you wake up, your brain's churning, and it's making stuff up. And I got that first paragraph in my head. I had absolutely no idea whether I was going to be able to do anything with it or not. And so I started writing and wound up throwing away a lot of the first attempts. But once Alfred started telling his story, he would not be quiet. <laughs> and I recognized pretty early on that it would be more than one book. So that's when I started planning the idea of a series and sort of a story arc of a series. And I had originally thought it was going to be four books and that would be it. When I got to the end of volume four, it was really clear that there were so many threads in the tapestry of Alfred's life that I just had not tugged on yet. And there was so much more there that could be told that I decided, okay, let's, let's run with it a little bit longer. And Alfred is still talking. So I, I think volume six is probably going to be it, but we'll see what he has to say when we get there. Fair. Um, Will readers who like strong female characters be disappointed? I hope not. Um, I've actually tried to write several strong female characters into the story. Uh, Alfred's wife in particular is uh, unusual for her era. She is educated. She has a mind of her own. She's determined to... Uh, do something more important than just sitting around the court and doing her needlepoint. Um, I modeled her to some degree on some of the stronger women characters in the late Middle Ages and early Renaissance. Uh, I won't say she's a, a, a 100% replica of any of them. But if you think about people like Eleanor of Aquitaine, who was educated, if you think about even some of the people who might have been um, more on the sidelines of history as we think of it, people like Catherine Swinford, who was the, um, the wife of John of Gaunt, um, people like, uh, eventually, Elizabeth I, who was a really strong female personality, but she's later than the era of my stories. But if you take some of the really positive, um, uh, almost more modern, I would say, attributes of those women and kind of put them together, uh, Alfred's wife is one. His mother is going to turn out to be more interesting than you will first believe when you start the series. And um, the second wife of his uncle also turns out to be, she, she begins as a 
more traditional um, woman of the time and the circumstances that follow her and the events that uh, play into her life really transform her into a very strong female character as well. So I hope that those who like strong women in a story will not be disappointed, even though the books are told from Alfred's point of view. Wonderful. Well, you use, you seem to use contra, uh, contractions in your books, uh, both in dialogue and in narrative. And some editors might frown on that, particularly for a story set in the era you've chosen. So why did you make that choice? It was a combination of approachability and, uh, and accuracy, actually. If you go back and look into Old English and Middle English, and if you do the same thing in some other European languages, uh, you find that there were actually contractions used much longer ago than we would ordinarily think. Uh, I actually did some digging that turned up that in French, contractions were in use at the time of Charlemagne, which is very, very early. Um, Middle English has a lot of contractions that people would not be familiar with. Some of that may have been done simply the same way we come to contra contractions in our own modern speech, just because we run things together. But some of it also derives from the fact that ink and parchment were very expensive. And so when people set out to write something, they tried to use the least amount of space possible on the page and the least amount of ink possible to say something. So when they could contract two words into one, it saved space and it saved ink. And so contractions have been with us for a long time. If you doubt it, just look at Shakespeare. Now, yes, Shakespeare is a little bit later than my stories, but not all that much later. But his work is full of contractions. I never knew so any of this. So having that foundation, that historical accuracy foundation, I decided that it was very important for my characters to be approachable for them to speak in a way that readers would, that the flow would just be there. Totally agree. Um, let me ask you a question. Your author bio says that you share your home with two Pembroke Welsh corgis and that walking them gives you inspiration for writing. How so? <laughs> well, they're convinced that it does. <laughs> uh, actually, I think it does as well. It does about three things. One is it gets me up and it gets me moving and that's always useful to, to get the creative juices flowing. Uh, another thing that it does is that it, it gives me a way to break out of what I'm thinking of the intensity of a scene I'm working on and to really just kind of step back and look at it. And I often surprise myself how often when I just, step away, the clarity is suddenly there. Then the third way that it helps is that classic advice to writers is write every day, write every day, write every day. Well, to my way of thinking, that doesn't always have to be sitting there typing away on your keyboard or, or writing in a journal. You can be writing in your head. And when we get a chance to go on a long walk, if there's something that, that I know is the next thing I need to be working on or a particular scene that's necessary to, to get this narrative to the next stage, um, I often just will craft an entire scene in my head while we're walking through the park. So nice. Um, so do your dogs work their way into your fiction? Um, they have. Not my two in particular, but um, you will discover in volume one of the Chronicles that um, Alfred becomes patron of the Royal Kennel. And the Royal Kennel um, 
is the source of the, the most important bloodlines for the herding dogs, for the, all the sheep herders and cattle herders in the kingdom. Um, and Alfred's daughter will eventually become uh, very um, connected to, to the dogs in ways that I will leave it to readers to explore. Um, um, I, I also noticed that you sell organic pet treats through a business called Village Pump Specialties. Uh, what inspired that? And do you see doing any joint promotion, selling pet treats with your books or vice versa? Well, I hadn't thought about that, but that's an interesting idea. Now, that actually came about, <coughs> excuse me, quite um, almost by accident. I had um, the youngest of my two corgis um, needs extra fiber in her diet. And so she gets pumpkin on her, her meals t twice a day. Um, and I needed to go on a trip. This was actually a research trip. And so they were going to have to board for the week that I was going to be gone. And I'm like, okay, how am I going to get her her pumpkin? And uh, without, you know, having to ask the people that were born to keep track of this can of pumpkin and put some on her in all of this. And I thought, you know, I can make pumpkin cookies for her. And so I started making the little pumpkin cookies and that was really easy to give to somebody and say, put four of these on top of her meal. Um, and once I started doing that, it was like, okay, she liked them and my other dog loved them. And then I started thinking about other ways to um, use the pumpkin in making treats for them. And I was talking to a friend of mine whose dog happens to like green beans and broccoli. And I thought, hmm, what can I do with something green? And what other kinds of things besides pumpkin are there out there that dogs might like? Well, there's butternut squash, believe it or not. There's sweet potatoes, there's spinach, there's all sorts of things. So I started putting these things together and I've got a whole line of treats now. I, and they love bananas and they love apples. And before the days of COVID-19, I actually um, had a favorite uh, artisan craft show that I went to twice a year. And that was my primary means beside the website for selling my treats. But your idea of, you know, mixing books and pet treats, why not? I'll give it a try sometime. Great idea. So let me ask you, since you brought up COVID-19, what plans do you have for travel after the lockdown? And will any future books feature other aspects of your love of travel, or do you think you'll stay with historical fiction? You know, my primary love is historical, and I do have a um, an idea in the works. In fact, I was scheduled to go to France to do some primary research for that uh, work in progress sort of idea at the beginning of um, March. And I wound up canceling that trip. I'm glad I did because who knows whether I would have gotten home or not. But um, I do plan as soon as it makes sense to travel again, I do plan to follow up on that. Um, I have several other ideas that aren't necessarily historical. I've got a, a, an idea for a mystery. I've got an idea for something that's based a bit on family history. Um, I've got an idea that is not so far back in history that would be set on the Channel Islands during World War II. So there's lots of lots of stuff whirling around up here in the brain cells and we'll see which ones actually make it to the page successfully because you know some of these things you try and you get so far and it's like okay this isn't going to work so you shelve that and you move on to the next one oh, it sure you've sounds had that great. Experience too. so i was hoping you might read from a few pages of your book before we finish up i'd love to um Let's get the reading glasses out. 
And what will you be, are you reading from the new book or from one of the uh, Yes, this is from Pestilence, and I don't know how well that's showing up with the it's light on it. Probably it's not very nice well. Cover. No, I can see it looks like a good cover. Yeah, thank you. Um, this is from the first chapter, and um, it is toward the end of the first chapter, but it is um, essentially what sets up the entire narrative for the whole book. It's the last letter that Alfred's father left to him. My beloved son, if you are reading this, then you know that I have taken no steps to alter the succession. Whether that will be my conscious decision or whether fate will intervene to take that decision from my hands is unknown as I write this. Perhaps that is for the best, for it frees me to say the words that are in my heart and in my mind unencumbered by any foreknowledge of what may transpire. This choice is the most daunting I've ever had to face. We both know what sort of king John will be. John is Alfred's elder brother, by the way. I have no wish to inflict that on our kingdom, but if I alter the succession, I fear the consequences may be even worse. John would not hesitate to oppose you, even, I fear, to the point of raising troops against you and there can be no possible good outcome from civil war. Of one thing I am certain, you're as well prepared as anyone could be to cope with the coming challenges and to find ways to make things better for our people, regardless of what John may do. Your four friends are your best allies. Use their counsel and assistance well. You have the trust and respect of all the lords, even including Merritt and who, I've no doubt, will align with his peers if he perceives any threat to the future of the realm, and especially if he perceives a threat to his own hide. Despite my sadness, I'm forced to smile. Father had a knack for seeing the lighthearted side of even serious matters. I'll miss that dreadfully. I hope Rupert is still at your side. Though he never voiced it openly, I believe your grandfather thought Rupert was the most capable of all his sons, and over the years I have come to agree. Your uncle will never steer you wrong. Abbot Andre and Prior Warren consider themselves your friends and protectors. Allow them to be just that. Do not forget Alice and Gwendolyn. They will see things you may not. They understand nuances of human behavior that may seem foreign to a man's mind. And your mother can manage John's behavior when no one else can. Let her judge best how best to do that. John would never harm her, but excessive pressure from her might cause him to banish her from court, and then you would lose her influence entirely. I know John's reign will be regressive. My greatest fear is that it may be repressive. Our people have no memory of that for two, perhaps three generations have lived their entire lives in an enlightened progressive society. If he is too harsh or if the people's lives become intolerable, they may rise up against him. Such an uprising might succeed if, and only if, the people and the nobles are united. And that is my most important advice to you, my son. Whatever happens, you must survive. I know not if your grandfather was right in foreseeing an important destiny for you, or what that destiny might be. I know only that you cannot fulfill it if you are not alive. Retreat from public life if that seems best. Go into seclusion if necessary. Flee if you must, for you would be welcomed and protected in any of our neighboring kingdoms, including, I think, even the territories. But no matter what, stay alive. Even if your destiny is no more than to prepare Geoffrey and little Edward to be advisors to future kings, that is a worthwhile endeavor, and they will need your wisdom and guidance to become such men. You're a good man, Alfred, and I am exceedingly proud of you. My only regret in this life is that I could find no way to leave you the throne. But I leave my legacy and that of your grandfather in your hands. And perhaps that is even more important. That was great. Thank you. I think everybody should rush out and get the entire collection. And the third one is coming out on June 11th. And then you said the fourth one is coming out in December, correct? That's correct. So I think everybody should be looking for Pamela Taylor's books. They're with Black Rose Writing, and you can find them on Amazon um, as well. They're out in paperback as well. 
That's correct. Paperback, ebook, and the first two are audiobooks as well. I'm waiting to see if we get an audiobook for Pestilence. Oh, perfect. Well, thank you for spending some time with me. I wish you best of luck with the book and with the writing career, and I hope to speak to you again soon. In it's been my pleasure. I'd love to do it again. Perfect. And uh, as always, stay safe. You too. Thank you. Over the river to the city far from home The toll booth takes my money And the city takes my soul And I see the river kissing the city in the dawn She dances round as her boy is turning on her hip The steel blue waters touch the stone of the skin The city's tossing spears, spears I 